If you are just joining us, my name is Andrea Bassing Matney, and I am the Community Outreach Programs and Support Specialist for Research Services at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. A few quick notes before we start. You can submit your question for a speaker via Twitter using hashtag GenFair2014. We have allotted 10 minutes for questions and answers at the end of each session. For captioning, go to the Virtual Genealogy Fair website and click on the link for today. The lectures will be recorded and posted on the Virtual Genealogy Fair website by the end of November. Lecture number six is entitled, The Genealogical Significance of World War I Draft Registration Cards, and our speaker is Zena Roan. World War I draft registration cards provide a wealth of genealogy information, including the registrant's name, date and place of birth, citizenship status, ethnicity, nearest living relatives, occupation, and the registrant's physical description. Zena is an archives technician for research services. She works at the National Archives at Atlanta, Georgia. I am now turning the microphone over to Zena. Good morning, everyone. Um, just going to get started with the presentation. Um, can we advance to slide four, please? My workshop goals. I'm going to give a brief presentation of the historical perspective of World War I, explain the creation and arrangement of the cards, and discuss the genealogical significance of the cards. Next slide, please. Historically, um, World War I was a turning point for not only the world, but um, America. And at the beginning, to start it off, the Archduke of Australia and his wife, the Duchess, were assassinated on June 28th of 1914. Um, the couple um, at the time had three children and were, the following Wednesday was going to celebrate their 14th wedding anniversary. Um, Sophie was a commoner and she was not allowed to accompany the Archduke on a lot of his um, formal um, presentations because of her status. Um, but the Archduke was not well liked. Um, in fact, one German historian described him as a man of uninspired energy, dark in appearance and emotion who radiated an aura of strangeness. Um, but he was assassinated. Next slide, please. Princip was a Serbian nationalist who assassinated the Archduke and the Duchess after the first assassin from his group failed at his assassination attempt. The first man um, threw a grenade at the car, which bounced off, landing in the street, just as the second car passed over it. I will say that they were invited to a luncheon at the governor's um, mansion, and that's where they were on their way to. And since it was so close to their anniversary, the Duke, uh, the Archduke thought this was a great way for them to spend some time together. And um, it was, since it was not a formal affair, that she could accompany him and they would spend some time together next to their upcoming anniversary. But um, once the second car passed over it, the explosion injured several people. Procession stopped and headed for the hospital. The road to the hospital placed them right in front of Princip. He uses his pistol and shoots two shots into the car. One hits the Archduke in the neck and the other hits the Duchess in the abdomen. And these are said to be the first shots fired in World War I. Um, another note, Princip was um, about 19 years old at this time. He had just been turned down for um, Army. He wanted to enlist in the Army, but he was too scrawny and sickly, 
And he was a very angry young man, and just like a lot of um, youth, when they get a um, an idea or they get a cause that they feel that's worth fighting for, they are rather radical. And he was basically um, just wanting to fight to make sure that his people um, were represented equally. At the time, there was a whole lot of unrest. There was a lot of um, racism against the Serbian population. Slide seven, please. Um, war is always about in, it, allies and enemies. Um, the Archduke was out of the picture, um, and Austria and Hungary were able to secure a promise from Germany to aid in the war against Serbia and possibly Russia. And if you look at the slide, you can see that there were treaties with a lot of countries were in treaty together, and um, they were you know, going to align to be able to fight against um, the other nations to um, make this come to an end. The Serbian and the Hungary, Hungarian people wanted to, I mean, excuse me, the Australian and Hungarian people wanted to make sure that the war was um, going to free them of the Serbians. Um, they didn't want them there. They wanted to regain um, access to the heights that they had lost in earlier wars, um, some civil wars. But the Russian and Serbian treaty was in place, the French and Russian treaty. Germany invaded Belgium to gain access to France, and Britain and France declared war on Germany. Um, the rest of the um, former colonies of Britain joined in. Japan, who was in treaty with Britain, declared war on Germany. The Austria and Hungary declared war on Japan for declaring war on Germany. So it was a little bit of back and forth with the enemies and aliens. And, you know, um, next slide. At this time, America tries to stay neutral. Everybody else on the other side of the pond is at war against each other. Um, the Allies, because of the treaties. But America just basically wanted no part of it. It doesn't involve us. We're not getting into it. But on May 1st, in 1915, the British liner, the Lusitania, was torpedoed by a German U-boat. The liner sinks, and 1,198 people die. 128 of those people were Americans. This outraged the Americans, and, you know, you had some that were crying, you know, let's, let's get them back, and then you had some that were against the war. Next slide. The U.S. declares war on April 6, 1917. Congress enacts the Selective Service Law May 18th. 1917. There are three registration dates. They call them celebration events. You saw small parades. You saw um, all kinds of patriotic um, demonstrations going on um, during this time. The first was June 5th, 1917. The next was June 5th, 1918. And the final um, registration was on September 12th. 1918. And of course, the end of the war was November 11th, 1918. The Selective Service Act of 18 May 1917, um, just the basic process for drafting individuals for induction to the U.S. Army. Five aspects of the act under the Provost Marshal General. Um, first, of course, the registration of these men. You had to make sure that um, you had boards set up. Um, one of the interesting notes about the local boards were usually they were people who knew you, and you saw a lot of um, people claiming that they had exemptions because of family 
and um, other obligations. But since the board members knew you, they would say, well, no, he doesn't have any exemptions. He's not married. He doesn't have a family. I don't even know why he put that. So there was no way for a lot of the registrants to be able to falsify their information um, and because the people knew them. The selection process was basically a lottery to determine the order of induction. Um, I couldn't find a lot of inter information on how this lottery was basically um, done. I just assumed that they maybe they drew names from a hat, I, I'm not sure, or maybe they had them in order and they just picked out a certain number of men um, according to the need for um, the different platoons that needed to be staffed with military men. Classification was a process for determining um, exemptions um, and, and slackers, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, the induction, reporting to the military, for military duty at the office of the local draft board. Entrainment. The inductions were um, delivered to the mobilization camps for training. And at this time, the provost marshal general and the selective service system um, were completed. They didn't, they no longer had any um, anything to do with the process once they were inducted into the military service, they were, they were the property of the U.S. Army, basically. Um, next slide, 11. Less than 10% of the 4 million men who registered were actually drafted. Um, these records are held here at this repository, um, the National Archives at Atlanta, um, under Record Group 163, and they are the records of the Selective Service System. Records were transferred um, to the Adjutant General in Washington, D.C., on November 27th of 1918. Um, basically, nobody knew what to do with these records, so you'll see that they were transferred back and forth, um, or this agency said, no, we can't do anything with them, and then they went to another place. Um, after this, they were transferred to the U.S. Census Bureau, and they held on to them until they were accessioned by the National Archives in 1940. In 1956, they transferred to our old facility, um, our previous location in East Point, Georgia. We were um, in the same building as the Federal Records Center at that time. Um, we had about a three-year period from 2002 to 2005 um, that we used to rebox and relocate um, the 24 million draft registration cards to our current facility in Morrow, Georgia. Next slide, number 13, please. This is a picture of the room that we used um, to actually start processing the reboxing of the cards. Um, this room was used as not only our um, research room, it was also a room where we did holdings maintenance and reboxing and refoldering of many of our um, holdings at the time. Um, the old cardboard boxes, um, we used to call death boxes because they don't allow for the cards to have any protection from moisture or um, light, um, they basically don't absorb any, any of the moisture. And now um, all of our holdings for the World War I cards are in what we call 25% cotton bond um, folders or boxes. Slide number 14, please. 
what do the card look cards look like? Um, there are three different registration dates, three different forms of these cards, and there are three different sets of questions. Um, it appeared that they were trying to gain information at different times according to the age groups of the men that were being um, registered at the time. On June 5th, 1917, um, slide number 15, all men ages 21 through 31 who were born between June 6, 1886 and June 5th, 1896. Um, were to report to register at their local board. And you see um, we've got over 9 million men registering at this time. Slide number 16, please. On June 5th, 1918, the B card was um, introduced. And all men who had become 21 since the previous registration the year before were to um, register. And these men were born between June 6, 1896, and September 20, excuse me, August 24, 1897. This was called a supplemental registration um, on August 4th for men who had become 21 since the June 5th date of that same year. And you have a little over um, 900,000 men registered at this time. Um, I like this particular card, Silas Firecloud. Um, a lot of these people who registered did not have what we call um, westernized names. Um, and you will see a lot of that. It gives you a good um, demographic of the type of men that were registering at the time. And of course, this man was a Native American. Slide number 17. Um, the C card um, was introduced September 12, 8, 1918. All men, men ages 18 to 21 and men 31 to 47 registered um, at this time. And these men were born, um, they went back and they caught all of the older men, or what this is what we call the old man draft. And um, we also call this the, the baby draft because most of these men would just have been turning 18 um, as of September of 1900. So this was the catch-all registration. And we have about 13 million men registering at this time. Slide number 18, please. The cards are arranged. Um, all three of the cards are going to be included in one um, in one box, and the cards. Um, are filed in alphabetical order by state. Um, thereafter, alphabetically by county and in numerical order by the local draft board. Next, alphabetically by the surname and then the given name. Um, the exceptions are usually your larger cities. I have Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York. Um, any of the larger cities because the draft boards, there would be more than one draft board for that particular area. Next slide, please. Number 19. Um, the draft guards give you amazing demographic snapshot. They're more than just face value. When you look at the card, you just basically see the man's name and the information, um, personal information on him, his address, and um, what he was doing for an occupation. Um, and it gives you a good snapshot of what was going on in the area where the man registered. Um, 
another thing to note um, that there was a lot going on behind the scenes um, with the bickering of the draft boards, um, the locals who knew the men who were registering, um, those who basically thought it was unfair, um, all kinds of things that would just go on when something new is introduced and made mandatory. Slide number 20, please. Um, citizenship played a major part in the drafting process. They were separated by several different categories. Um, the natural born citizen, the naturalized citizen, the allied alien citizen, um, the neutral alien citizen, and um, the enemy aliens. Um, those were people that were born in the nations that were at war with the U.S. and our allies at the time of World War I. Um, prisoners, um, inmates, patients, Indians, all of these people were considered um, at a non-citizenship status at that time when they were either an inmate or, or they were a patient or they were um, in, in Indian. Um, Indian and prisoners are actually held in the same um, category and they are boxed together within the various states. Um, you saw a major resistance in the southern states, um, especially for farmers. Them being the majority of the draftable men objected to the unfair exemptions that the upper class and the industrial working class did not have to go through. So um, farmers were deemed a lot of times as the expendable population. They said, well, we can send them all off. We need our upper class people and we need our industrial workers to stay here. Um, and this is another um, important genealogy and historical nugget that World War I was basically the turning point from the um, agricultural age into the industrial age. Um, of course, we were already into the industrial age, but this is a good marker point because it was right around this time that it became important for factory workers and um, machine-driven employment to take precedence over um, farming and anything that had to do with um, the agricultural process. Um, you had those who were arguing that this was a violation of the 13th Amendment um, because it prohibits um, slavery and involuntary servitude. But of course, Congress overruled that and said, no, we can draft people, we're at war. Slide number 21, please. Um, just wanted to go over this. This is basically just um, Russ, Lewis Russell Hall. Um, it just tells where he was at the time. You see that his age is 41, his date of birth, that he was a farmer, and his employer was myself. Um, he gave, again, his address as where as the location for his employment, and he listed his wife, Margaret Ann, as his next of kin. Um, number 22, um, this is um, what they call the Registrar's Report, and it basically, um, there are no pictures with the World War I draft card, but it basically gives you a description of the person and um, you can kind of um, imagine what he may have looked like. He was tall, of a medium build, with blue eyes and brown hair. He had no um, anything that qualified him for exemption. Um, he had all his arms, his legs, his eyes were fine. Um, but this was not always the case with the registrant. Um, slide number 23. Um, 
Um, this is an example of, um, I picked this one because this man was a non-citizen, he was an alien, and he was non-declarant. Um, the thing about this is he was probably um, what they would call a um, allied alien because he lived in Canada, and um, we were um, allies with France at the time, so um, he was, this was just interesting. But if you look down, he's got a note on the bottom of the card. Slide number 24, please. Um, this is a typewritten card. Some of them wrote in by hand, and some of them actually had typewriters or typeset machines, and they were able to type the information onto the card. Um, um, this gentleman was a woodsman, and it also lists that he was um, his marital status was single and his race was Caucasian. And basically, when most people get their cards, this is what they look like. There's not a whole lot going on on the card, but it does give you an idea of where this person was um, during the draft, World War I draft process. Slide number 25, please. This is the card of Simon Alexander Haley. Um, we know that um, Alex Haley was the um, author of the book Roots that was later turned into um, a miniseries back in the 70s. And basically, um, Alex did his genealogy from his first an the first ancestor that he could locate as coming from Africa all the way up to himself. So you have Kunta Kinte, which was his ancestor, um, and then you have all of the descendants up until you get to Alex himself. Um, the interesting thing about this card is that although Alex lists Savannah, Tennessee as his residence or his home address, um, you go down and you see that if you look at item number seven, that he is a student and he's away at college and he is actually in Greensboro, North Carolina. And this will happen a lot if you see men who are around college age who were privileged enough to go to college. A lot of times they were not where you thought they would be um, during the drafting process. They were away at college, and that's why a lot of times you will not find um, your particular man when you're looking for him in his home area, he will actually be away at college. Or um, you saw other men, um, you saw this again with um, men that were maybe porters on trains, men that worked for the railroads, longshoremen, men that did um, work on, on the oceans or were fishermen, things like that. They would have to go to the nearest draft board at the time to register versus going to the local board at their home. Slide number 26. Um, in order to begin your search, first of all, you need to know when the man was born. Um, some people are not sure when their, when their um, ancestor was born, but men born between 1872 and 1900 were the men that were registering for the draft at that time. So you need to know his full name and any other names he may have used. A lot of times you will look for somebody under their um, legal name, but maybe they were called something else. Um, you see a lot of nicknames on here, and that um, it's something to keep in mind if you knew that your family used another name for that person, you may want to look under that name if you don't find them under their um, given name. Slide number 26. 
seven. Um, nuggets are things that we find that maybe were included in the cards that we didn't know about an ancestor um, prior to our search. Um, sometimes we find um, information that will help us bridge gaps. For instance, we know that the 1890 census was lost, and um, this gives you an, a bridge between um, the 19, I mean, the, the 1880 census and the 1900 census. Um, we do have people that were born right after 1880. We have people that were born um, closer to the 90s and just right before um, the 1900 census. And so this is a great um, genealogy nugget to fill in that information. Um, you can also locate where um, foreign-born ancestors may have been at the time. Um, it'll give you an idea of what status they were at as far as citizenship. They can also assist in researching African and Native American ancestors um, because the men have to put their race. And you will also see that in um, the first draft card, the card A, the corner was to be cut off if the person was of African of African descent. Number twenty-eight, father and son at the same address. A lot of times, um, like I was saying, we lose track of um, men that were born. Um, right after the census or right right prior to um, one of the census. And we see that this is a father and a son. Um, they both have the same name, but you do see um, this would be a great genealogy nugget because you've got two um, generations right here in one household. And it lets you know what was kind of going on with, with your family um, at that time. Slide number 29, please. A lot of times we have people that write us when they've um, searched for the cards um, on any of the search engines um, and weren't able to locate a card for them. There are many reasons why a lot of times you will not be able to locate a card for um, your person. Um, only about 6,000 men who were draft eligible for the draft did not register. Um, of course, if your person was one of those people, there's not going to be a card for him. Um, they registered at a different board. A lot of times, if they were working away from a rural area, maybe they had to go into the cities to work in one of the factories, or they had a job that took them away just like the card I showed you previously with um, Alex Haley, um, they would have to go to um, their nearest draft board. There are variations in the spelling. There are, are assumed in nicknames. Incorrect information. The person just did not register. He was already enlisted at service at the time of prior to the um, order to to register, then you're not going to find a card for him. Um, most men who were already in the service did not have to register for a draft. Um, they're improperly filed. We do have people coming to this facility looking at the original draft cards. And a lot of times, even though we, you know, tell them the procedure for viewing the cards, they may misfile it back in the box and it may be in the wrong box, you have people that look at more than one box and sometimes they don't put it back where it belonged. So you will see improperly filed cards. Um, they were not in the general population. Of course, like I said, if they were in prison or hospitalized or any other reason were not in the general population, you're not going to find a card for that person. 
Slide number 30, please. If you look at this card, you will notice that this man was, um, at first she put non-citizen Indian and was scratched through, and then he went down and he put alien non-declarant. Um, also note that he was born in and was a subject of Germany who at the time would have been considered an, in, an enemy alien. Um, but he was improperly listed as um, an Indian and, like I said, actually an enemy alien. Slide number 31. I I tend to feel sorry for anyone who was actually looking for this man, uh, Mr. Fat Oats, unless they knew um, that this was a nickname that this man used. I don't, um, if you look down, I guess you could, you could also track him by, um, he has Josie Oats as his um, nearest living relative, which might be one way that you would locate him. Um, if you were trying to do a um, genealogy search on Mr. Oates, um, he registered, you know, under a nickname. So, like I said, always keep that in mind that the person did not always use their um, legal or given name. And sometimes they didn't use their first name. They may have used a middle name um, during registration. Slide number 32, please. Um, this person was an inmate and was removed from citizenship by incarceration. And this was um, pretty common. Um, also, keep in mind that um, a lot of the people that um, basically were supposed to register basically just jumped on whatever was smoking to get out of the area and did not register. Slide number 33, please. No recognized citizenship classification. Um, this particular person was a non-citizen Indian. Um, Indians did not receive um, citizenship until 1924, and so they would have been considered um, non-citizen unless they were one of the um, five civilized tribes. Um, they would not be able to claim citizenship. So a lot of times you will see them, um, they won't be among the population in the county that you look in. They may be in the prisoner and Indian um, classification boxes. Slide number 34. Um, this is just an example of a person that was um, in um, an institute institution during the time that he was supposed to register. He was a patient and um, if you look at the register's report, it says that he was feeble-minded. So he was removed from the um, population due to an illness or an infirmity. Number 35, please. There are a lot of reasons people use the draft registration cards. Um, genealogy is usually the most common reason that they're used. But we have people who want to, who are doing um, books, who maybe are writing um, a, a dissertation and they may want to include our documents. Um, some of the other reasons we have um, heroes, athletes, entertainers, politician, artists, and authors who are also um, registered within the draft registration cards. 
Slide number 36, please. This is um, the card of Alvin York. Um, he had an exemption claim. Uh, one of the things I might tell you about exemption claims, you did have conscientious objectors. Um, and I guess he was actually drafted. So I guess his, yes, I don't want to fight um, claim for exemption was not enough to keep him out of military service. And there are all kinds of um, interesting exemption claims that people have. And, you know, um, the, the fact that the draft boards were made up of local people always seem to come back to haunt them. Slide number 37, please. Um, we do have cards that are considered intrinsic value, and usually these are cards that um, basically you could, um, they're original signatures of notable famous people. Um, this card is for George Herman Ruth, known as Babe Ruth, and this would be a gold mine find for anyone who was a baseball um, lover, you would, they would love to get their heart, hands on this card. These cards are intrinsic value, and if you go to the box looking for this particular card, you would find a copy of that card because these intrinsic value cards are held in a safe. Slide number 38, please. Another intrinsic value card. Louis Armstrong. It's interesting to note that on a lot of the African American cards, especially those before um, 1900, um, 1920, you will find that the 4th of July, Christmas Day, New Year's Day, um, the beginning of the seasons, um, the various solstice dates around the 20th, um, of the beginning of a season, you will see that that's what they put as their birth date. A lot of times when you're looking for that person and you see that they are born on the 4th of July, Christmas, keep in mind that they were born around the time of these um, holidays and they may not actually know their um, real birth date. So you will see this a lot of times, especially with African Americans and rural um, poor white Americans who did not, who were born to illiterate parents or were illiterate themselves, they would select holidays as their date of birth. Slide number 39, please. Um, this is just some. Um, Additional related records, the classification docket list, um, were maintained by local boards to show the process of classification, their physicals, their claims for exemptions. Every piece of paper that was sent to a man who was of um, eligible draftable age um, was kept in the, one of these dockets. All that information was put down into a docket book. The post marshal general's office records um, are kept here also. These are lists of men ordered to report. Um, you also have delinquents and deserter forms included with these records. Slide number 40. The classification list, um, we basically use the draft card to help us find the person listed on the classification list. If you look at the card um, for this gentleman, Samuel Pitts, um, you will note that in the very top corner, um, if you go over to the right of the um, of the card, you will see 
him as number 61. Right near the board registration card, you see the number 61. So this is um, actually his number on the listing in the draft classification list. If you go over to the column right beside his race, it says colored or abbreviation for colored, you will see that he is number 868. And you see that right near the word, word form one on the draft card. You will also note that Mr. Pitts was a person of African descent because his card is cut off as was common with the first edition card. This list also would give anything that was sent to him, all of the questionnaires that were sent, the dates that they were sent to him and the dates that they were returned to him. And then you would go over and um, they would stamp a date for the final closeout, whether or not he was classified as a draftable person. Slide number 41. You had um, the number on the back of the card. This is the back of the card for Mr. Pitts. And this, it has um, the three digit number and then a letter. This would tell me the state that he was in, the county that he was in, and the number of the draft board. This particular county had more than one draft board, so he has A on his card. But the interesting thing about Mr. Pitts is, even though he had A on his card, I found him in the um, B docket for the classification list. So Tom, sometimes the information on the back of the card um, is kind of misleading, and you have to dig a little bit. But once I searched in um, classification book A and he was not there, I immediately went to um, the B book, and that's where I located him. Slide number 42, please. The list of men ordered to report. Um, this is, gives you a good um, snapshot of what was going on in the area, what was going on at the local draft board. Um, I just picked this one random. Um, and it gives just the name of the person. It also refers back to his order number in the classification docket list um, so that they can go through and they can see that, yes, he was one of the drafts. Um, nominees for that particular um, draft board. So it tells you his, um, his order number in the draft docket, his serial number. Um, it gives you his, um, his occupation, and then it tells you what classification that he was noted under um, so that you would know what was the next action that you would take um, for someone who was ordered to report. Slide number 43. Delinquents and deserters. Uh, again, you see there's a list of, um, this is the final list. Um, the men ordered to report, and then they, after some time, you were um, ordered to report on a certain date, if you did not report, or if you reported an error, as you would see at the top of the page with the first per person, George Johnson, he reported by error. Um, some people were classified and were not draftable, and so he reported by error. Um, don't really know any more information on that, but it does just tell you what was going on with each and every man that was to report for um, military service. Um, I will say that for any of those who were delinquents and deserters, they were basically um, 
their information was sent from the local board to the provost marshal general's office. They were sent before a military tribunal. Um, they were court martialed, and most of them were sent to Leavenworth, which, who, which was the military holding prison for um, draft deserters or delinquent men. Um, most of these men were given anywhere from one to 17 years, and um, they had to serve out that time even after the war was over. A lot of them were still in prison. Slide number 44. We often get asked about World War I records. Um, these are not records. The draft cards are simply just a sign that the men complied with the order to register. Um, the, the records are actually um, going to be with um, record group number 147, Selective Service System Draft Registration Cards. And usually, um, those, those are for World War II. Um, we also um, refer a lot of people to the Military Personnel Record Center in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, if, we, if they want records for men who served in the military during World War I. You can also send, um, visit the web, um, selectiveservicesystem.gov to learn more information about where records for men who served in World War I and subsequent wars um, are, going, are being held. Most of these cards, well, all of the World War I cards have been digitized. Um, you can search for them in inter, on the internet or in person. I still get a lot of reference requests for the cards. Um, basically, now we can offer you a digital color scan of the card, or you can visit our order online. Ancestry.com is available and free at NARA facilities that have public access computers. You can also call me um, at 770-968-2100 and just tell us the information for the man that you're looking for on the card, and we will um, pull that card and make a copy for you. Um, the current price for a copy of a World War I card is $7. And I'd just like to ask at this time if there are any questions. Thank you, Zena. We do have several questions that came in from YouTube and Twitter. The first question is from Twitter. Was it mandatory to register for the World War I draft? If you were a man of eligible age, you, it was mandatory for you to, to register for the draft. Our next question is from YouTube. This next question is, I have my paternal grandfather's World War I draft card, so did they make two copies and give one to the registrant? Um, I know that they had what they called a stub card, which was a small card that could be carried in the billfold of the registrant. I'm not aware that they made a complete copy of the card. I think there was some kind of a little form that they gave the registrant when he did comply with registration. Thank you. That's very helpful to know. Our next question. I heard somewhere that the colors on the card indicated something important. Can't remember what or what colors... Any ideas? Um, each of the cards um, had a different, the first card was just a black and white card. I don't have them in front of me, and actually my notes are in black and white. So I don't have them in front of me, but each card um, had a different color. 
Um, the color didn't really mean anything. It just told you which particular um, edition of the card it was. Thank you so much. We still have several more questions to uh, follow up. The website lists the microfilm roll list for each state, but is there an online way to search for these images? Um, I will tell you that if you have um, the Institute edition of Ancestry.com, most of those cards are um, viewable on that search engine. The only thing that you have to do is you go to the Ancestry um, Dot com, and then what you would do is select card catalog, um, topic military, and World War I draft cards. It pulls up a form that you complete with the name of the person, his date of birth, um, his county and state location, and any other, other, any other information that you know on the particular individual. Thank you, Zena. We have several more questions. Is the information about the exemptions marked on the cards themselves? If so, what markings did the office make? Um, they do what they have. They have what they have, registrant notes. Um, sometimes we don't even know what the notes on there mean. They have certain um, symbols they'll put. You'll see O's or X or triangles or different things on the cards. And these were just individual notes that the register was putting on the card. But most of the time what you will see is um, you will see the register's report on the, on the rear of each card. Um, you also, if you go to the classification listings, um, there is a comment section and you will see comments for um, those that were made exempt because the, like I said the draft board members knew most of the people who were reporting for registration but um, most of the time if they wanted to claim exemption they actually put the reason on there themselves. Zena, we have one last we have one last question for you. Is there a difference between the cards posted on Ancestry and what you would get in a copy from the National Archives? Um, there is no different. Uh, there's no difference in the card. Um, sometimes people go on Ancestry, and for some reason or another, um, the printing quality of the card is not sufficient for them, so they will contact us, um, and we can give them a digital scan of the copy. Um, with, you know, very clear resolution. And that's why a lot of times people will contact us versus copying it from the internet. Thank you, Zena. We had one more very interesting question, thought we would add it to the list. Did ambulance drivers and nurses come under the draft? I've never been asked that question before, but um, I will say that I can research that, and if they would um, like, they can contact me, um, Zena Rohn, Zena.Rohn at N-A-R-A dot G-O-V, and I will research that and answer that question for them. Thank you, Zena. We are now going to move on to our next session. If the speaker did not get to your question, please send an email to inquire at nara.gov 